Well, good morning, afternoon, evening, night, wherever you are. We're so grateful to have you here today uh, for this 11th webinar in our series, Hands-On Practical Conservation for the Collections Professional. My name is Beth Sanders, and I'm the Vice Chair of the Registrar's Committee Western Region. And we have another great webinar planned for you all today. Before we get to that, first, I do want to take a quick moment and thank our sponsor. Today's sponsor is Cook's Crating. As one of the nation's oldest and most respected fine arts handlers and shippers, Cook's Crating and Fine Arts Transportation is the company that many of the greatest American museums, galleries, and collectors turn to for their art moving needs. Based in Los Angeles, California, don't forget to contact Cook's Crating for your crating, shipping, insulation, and storage needs. If you're not a member of RCWR, you should look at Linda's comment in the chat because we're doing these great webinars. So you should consider becoming a member today. We represent collections professionals in our nine Western states and membership is only $15 a year. In addition to this webinar series, we're looking forward to maybe hoping to have a few in-person events this year, uh, but we also send out our weekly job listing emails and our amazing quarterly newsletter full of great content. So it's a bargain at that rate. So if you're not a member, join today, rcwr.org. And if you are a member and haven't renewed yet, this is a great time to do it. We're about to roll over for the calendar year. Before I introduce our wonderful speaker, just a few quick Zoom logistics. This is the webinar format. So while you can see me and Samantha, you can't, we can't see you. So if you need to get in touch with us, you'll use the functions from Zoom. The chat, like many people are using, uh, is a great place to put your comments in, say hello. But if you have questions, please put them into the Q&A feature of the Zoom program. And this just collates all of our questions for Samantha to the end of the program so that we can address them all to her without scrolling back up through everyone's messages and communications in the chat. So if I see anything in the chat, I might ask you to uh, put it into the Q&A feature as well so that we don't lose that question. We are recording today's webinar, and so if you need to check back on it, share it, uh, send it to a colleague, but or reference it when you're doing your next project, we'll actually have it posted on our RCWR YouTube page, as well as on our website. If you do get our emails, you'll get it there as well, but if not, you can always go to rcwr.org and go to the workshops tab and you'll see all of the recordings embedded in there or subscribe to our YouTube page and you'll be able to see those as soon as they're published. So it will just take a couple days after, uh, after our webinar to get that up. Today, we are very fortunate to have Samantha Springer, the Principal Conservator for Art Solutions Lab back with us. Samantha established Art Solutions Lab, a cultural heritage and fine art conservation practice in Portland, Oregon in 2020. She provides collections care, courier, display mount, and treatment services for sculpture and variable art to regional arts and cultural organizations, artists, and private collectors. Her practice grows from a foundation of work in institutions with, a, with broad fine art collections, such as the Portland Art Museum and the Cleveland Museum of Art, as well as organizations with collections that focus on anthropological materials, such as the Field Museum in Chicago, and specific regions or people such as the Alaska State Museums and the National Museum of the American Indian. While Samantha remains a generalist due to the nature of her job, she has a particular interest in preventative conservation, sustainability, and working with living artists and cultural representatives as a means towards preserving less tangible aspects of artwork, such as artist intent. Today, Samantha will be speaking with us about caring for our ceramic objects in our collections, but I will plug back to our RCWR YouTube page because this is actually Samantha's second time being featured here. And we had a really wonderful presentation about how to run a conservation and condition survey in our collections last November. So if you scroll all the way back on our workshop page, that was our, our first webinar uh, from this series. So don't forget to look that up. Without any further ado though, I am going to turn off my camera and turn it over to Samantha and her screen. Thanks, Beth. Um, 
for inviting me to speak today and to all of our attendees for coming and spending some time with us. So I know that um, time is valuable. And so um, I hope to make it worth your, worth your while. Um, and I'm just so happy to be a part of this really great group of talks and webinars that you have been organizing. And so thanks for um, putting the work in towards that. I know it can be a lot of work to <laughs> do that type of organization. Um, so I'm going to start, I'm going to share my uh, presentation here. Okay. So today um, I'm going to talk about the practical care of ceramics and you have, if you've attended some of the webinars in the past, in this past series, um, you will likely hear some common themes over um, during my talk um, <clears throat> and maybe some repetition and hopefully um, we know that repetition helps people remember. So um, those are all good things. Um, so my goals for today are that, um, you know, I hope that you will gain some confidence in determining what care you can provide for the ceramics. And um, this is not a one size fits all kind of um, presentation. Um, with the information that I'm giving you, I hope that each of you will really um, just better understand where your own kind of knowledge set is and what you are comfortable with doing and where kind of that border is where you will need to call in someone else to um, do the work. So um, how to carry out your the care safely, um, not just for the objects, but also for yourself. And then also, yeah, going back to this, figuring out when you need to call for, for more help. Um, and so I hope that I will be able to provide you with this information to evaluate those parameters and make better decisions. So today um, I will be talking about the type, different types of ceramics and um, ident a little bit about identification. Um, we don't have all, this is not you know a full course, so I'm not going to go into every detail of identification, but focus on what is important towards um, general care. Um, I'll go over general care practices, um, including preventive care, um, what the agents of deterioration put um, ceramics at most risk, cleaning methods. So this will range from like stain reduction to um, and surface cleaning, also to maintenance care, um, which is typically more, or, and ranging from dusting, so dry cleaning methods, also to wet cleaning methods. And then at the very end, I'll give a live demonstration of some of the kind of most useful and common cleaning practices. Um, and, and then we'll end with a period for questions and answers. So, um, let's, so starting with types and categories of ceramics. So similar to other types of cultural heritage objects, we can categorize cer ceramics in a variety of different ways. Um, so like I have listed on the slide here, you can look at style. Um, where's the object from? Is it, was it made in France? Was it made in China? Was it made in Africa? Um, we will, uh, what type of surface decoration um, does it have? Um, does it have a, a matte kind of um, slip paint glaze um, or does it have a very shiny glaze? Um, is the glaze on the entire surface or does it actually have paint um, on it? And looking at like what kind of a clay body does it have? And then also um, you can categorize by the time period that an object has come from. So is it, um, you know, a historic uh, ancient piece um, or is it a contemporary? And that can start to inform um, 
your not only your decisions, but also inform how you um, can identify what the object is made out of. <clears throat> and so the importance of kind of starting to categorize your ceramic um, is because this will help you um, inform the types of care that are best for the object. Um, so I don't want to dismiss the importance of a lot of this information, but because it can be really um, or extremely helpful to have this contextual information to inform material identification. Um, and I'm not going to kind of give you a history lesson on ceramics, um, but by, by using this information and here um, you go to your catalog records, your curators, um, your specialists in those areas, um, but this can really help make you make an informed guess about the type of ceramic that you're dealing with. And um, so for conservation and collections care, the most important aspect of um, the ceramic is what it is made from and the um, kind of firing temperature. <clears throat> So when I talk about what it's made from, I'm really talking about the clay body and um, the firing temperature uh, really is means like how cooked, <laughs> how cooked is the clay? What's the temperature that it is fired at? So, <clears throat> excuse me. So as I said, the most important for conservation treatment is the type of clay body. So there are several different types um, that we generally categorize ceramics into. Um, these would be earthenwares, stonewares, and porcelain. And of course, there's lots of different um, varieties within those three categories, um, but these are the three main categories that you should kind of think about um, in terms of identifying. And the three types of clay bodies will then um, uh, give you some sense of the firing temperature that uh, ceramic has been um, heated to. So um, uh, I, I have them listed in order of like the temperature. So earthenware is fired at a lo the lowest temperature, whereas porcelain is fired to the highest temperature. And um, the, the reason this is important will um, become clear later. I'll explain as we go along. So um, let's see, just thinking about the types of kilns that ceramics are fired in, um, you, in the oldest times, in the earliest times that ceramics were made, um, they were cooked in wood fires, um, with wood fires, and those burn at about just for reference at about 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, now we have electric and gas um, powered kilns and each of these environments can give you, will impact the way that a ceramic comes out. Um, so uh, people have, uh, ceramicists have a lot of control over, you know, whether it is there's a lot of oxygen in the kiln, um, or if it's a reduction kiln, so they've reduced the amount of oxygen that can cause um, the glazes and the ceramic body to, um, to have different effects on the coloration. Um, and <clears throat> so an anoxic or a reduction kiln um, is where the air intake is actually smothered. And sometimes this could be by just closing a valve. Um, and other times they actually put organic material into the kiln in order to reduce the, um, the amount of oxygen. And the most classic example of, um, of an anoxic uh, type of uh, decorative um, element is on um, red figure and black figure um, uh, ancient Greek ceramics pottery. Um, and so uh, I threw out that number for the 2000 degrees for the wood fire, because, um, and not that you need to remember these numbers, but um, just thinking about 
um, vitrification and how particles start to fuse together. So that actually happens at 1600 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and then what a high uh, temperature for a kiln is a, over 3000 degrees Fahrenheit, um, which is what porcelain is fired at. So here I, I pulled these images from the Spruce um, website, which just had these really cute um, didactics to um, show you kind of the varying um, uh, firing temperatures. And so um, stoneware you can see on the right there is really fired at this these lower temperatures, closer to the 2000 range. Um, or sorry, earthenware is in the center and um, fired to the highest of around 2000. And then stoneware on the right um, is just above 2000, whereas porcelain is really up um, at the highest temperature. And so the firing temperature is important because during the, the firing process, um, the clay particles and components start to fuse and center together. So I'm just going to give you these um, images are from the book Conservation and Restoration of Ceramics. And um, so clay is made up from these platelet particles. So that's what you're seeing in the image on the left. So at the top, um, you know, clay uh, is worked in wet. And so water in the clay actually acts as a lubricant for the particles to move side to side. And these platelets are kind of in um, a flat, they're not round or cubed shaped, they're really kind of like more flat and they slide against each other um, with the water. And then as the water evaporates and the clay dries out, you can see how the platelets become more packed together. Um, but at this stage, they're really just um, close together and you might have a hard clay, but un, um, until it is fired up to that 1600 degrees Fahrenheit, you can add water back to the clay and it will start to dissolve. Um, and so um, identifying whether your clay is fired or not is can be very important in terms of cleaning. If you think about, um, you don't wanna put water onto a clay that has not been fired because it will start, you'll start to remove the actual, the clay material. And then, um, so you might all stoneware, um, you might have like other aggregate material within those platelets and that will help strengthen the ceramic body. It can cause different colorations. So that's why you get like um, a difference between red clays and white clays um, um, or porcelain, which is primarily made of kaolin, which is a white um, uh, mineral. Oh, sorry, I'm just gonna go back. Um, <clears throat> so once you start firing the clay, um, your dried clay, you get past that 1600 degree Fahrenheit stage and that's when sintering starts, that's S-I-N-T-E-R. And so what that means is that the particles actually start to fuse together. And so you can see in this image on the right that, um, <laughs> There, uh, these little uh, dots indicate that the the particles are actually adhering, um, chemically bonding to each other, or physically bonding to each other. Excuse me. <clears throat> and so, as the temperature increases, those fusion points also grow, and you get greater and greater. Um, uh, adhesion um, between the different particles. So they actually fuse together. And um, just like in the image on the left, where as the water is dries, the particles pack together. Um, as you fire and um, as vitrification happens, so vitrification is um, the process of becoming more glass-like, um, the particles actually um, 
kind of, kind of compress together and it they pack together more tightly. So during the firing process, the clay will actually start to shrink a little bit. So what I wanna show you here is that when you have um, a broken ceramic, so hopefully most of you don't have broken ceramics, but um, if you do already have some, you can start looking at those break edge surfaces and you can learn a lot about um, your ceramic by looking at that. So on the left here, we have the break edge of uh, an earthenware. Uh, looks very, hopefully very um, familiar to you, just like a clay, pot um, terracotta planter and on the right we have in the middle this is um, closer to a stoneware and you can see that the um, the it's I know it's hard to see in just a picture um, but this the clay body which is this white color um, is more matte and the, the glaze is a distinct layer on the top on the surface um, or on the exterior surfaces. And then on the right, we have a porcelain with a red glaze on the outside. So not to confuse you, but um, porcelain becomes almost totally glass-like when it's fired. And so um, the glaze, which is a very glassy material, actually completely fuses and there's no distinct layer between the glaze and the clay body. Um, so when you're looking at these in person, you can start to see um, a difference in texture and sheen. Those are the things that you should be looking for. And um, if the ceramic looks more matte and the glaze is more glassy, then you probably have a stoneware or an earthenware with a glaze. Um, and then, um, as I said, the porcelains and those higher fired ceramics um, are more, the most vitreous. And so there's no distinct line between the glaze and the clay body. You might see a difference. You might see a line as in with this red glaze, just because there's a color difference. Um, but with magnification, you should not see any um, distinction between the materials. So knowing this can help you understand other damages that you might see on um, ceramics and help you determine when you need to get help um, from someone with more knowledge about um, the ceramics and towards cleaning and that type of thing. So um, here is an example of an earthenware with like a tin glaze. So, um, Earthenwares are easier to work with and um, on, are less expensive. Um, and so in order to make them look more like porcelain, they would have these white glazes, white also as a background, as a initial glaze color, obviously makes colors look more vibrant. And so um, here you can see maybe hopefully a little better um, how the ceramic body looks very has a distinct difference from the glaze um, and also the glaze can pop off of this so sometimes you'll have fragments that contain both the ceramic and the glaze but um, these are more likely to have the ceramic actually pop off of the surface as in this example and so um, often with earthenwares that are glazed they're because they have such different firing temperatures, um, there's um, a common problem is that there's insufficient fusion between the glaze and the ceramic body. So that is what is happening here. Um, and so this is obviously something to note um, before you go ahead and do any um, cleaning or something to note um, in terms of its general care. Um, this another similar problem um, on stoneware or and earthenware is that um, you can get soluble salts in the ceramic and this is the most common with archaeological objects but can happen from other um, from other environments and I'll get into that in a second so soluble salts um, are salts like table salt that dissolve in water. Um, and these can enter a clay body from the burial environment or when things are 
wet. Um, they can also, it can also happen through use. So if you have um, ceramics that are like kind of historically have been used in the past and then come into your collection, you can also see this happen. Um, what will happen is that they've absorbed into the clay body, they can go through glaze um, and you, if there's um, temperature flux or excuse me, relative humidity fluctuations, particularly if it drops, um, the salts can then dry and become, um, they're no longer wet and soluble, um, but then they um, become a physical crystal and the physical crystal is much larger than when it's in, in soluble in water and it can actually force glaze off of the surface or um, even crumble the ceramic um, body. And so that's what you're seeing in this left image here. Um, on the right are as a different kind of a salt or an efflorescence. Um, so this is this like white haze on this um, uh, Asian ceramic. And this haze is actually from storage material from um, a type of polyurethane foam or black foam. Um, and so the foam uh, degraded over time, released this pollutant that then um, was absorbed by the ceramic and caused this haze on the surface. Um, uh, and so this is something to look out for. Um, if you are seeing a white haze, it, it's not necessarily um, from a burial environment. So I talked a little bit about um, how salts and um, debris can go through a glaze and actually be absorbed by the clay body. So um, hopefully you can see this detail. There's like fine crack pattern, also known as crazing. It's very commonly seen. It's a fine cracking network in the glaze and is due to um, variable or incompatible cooling temperatures and shrinkage rates between the glaze and the ceramic. So it's not, um, sometimes it's an effect that um, the ceramicist was trying to get. Um, a lot of times it's not, um, and uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean there's an issue with your ceramic. It's just something to be aware of. Um, occasionally this, the differential in the shrinkage rates can be great enough to actually break a ceramic. It's most common with modern and contemporary pieces um, because if, if it happened on the historic or older piece, they probably, <laughs> you know, tossed it away and didn't use it anymore. But you can often, if there are those differentials in the shrinkage rates, it can cause, cause um, a distortion in the shape. And so you won't ever actually be able to put your object back together and get all of the pieces um, in alignment. There's so much tension in the, um, between, in the ceramic body. Um, so with historic ceramics, you might see these cracks darken due to staining. So organic matter from food and beverages will get into the cracks and become dark and even stain the ceramic underneath. And so sometimes this staining can be reduced or removed when it's desirable. Um, you should just keep in mind that sometimes um, evidence of use is an important part of the history of the object and is not always um, desirable for removal. Um, so going back a little bit, um, so the earliest ceramics are low fire. They're also known as terracotta or earthenware. And terracotta act literally means cooked earth. So these date back um, to approximately <laughs> 15,000 BCE. Um, and the first ceramics were found in China. So we have been using ceramics for such, humans have been using them for a very, very long time. Um, earthenware also includes ancient Greek red figure and black figure pottery. Um, stoneware dates back to approximately 2000 BCE in China. So just thinking about identification in the time period, um, 
you know, stoneware has been around for a very long time, but um, if you have even older things, you can start to um, kind of guess, oh, this might be earthenware because it's actually from this Neolithic period or something like that. Um, so um, while I have this picture of the earthenware up, I just want you to be careful about um, also confusing colored plaster for fired ceramics. Um, so um, plaster can be tinted to look like earthenware um, and plaster is also soluble in water. So you definitely want to make sure that you are identifying things correctly before you do um, anything. Um, particularly um, kind of a wet cleaning. Um, so low fire ceramic objects are no longer water soluble after firing, but they do remain porous. And you are probably familiar with like if you have a terracotta pot for your plants um, and you get it wet, it looks darker. Um, and that is the ceramic actually absorbing water. And porous earthenware is um, more resilient or less brittle than high fired ceramics, but they, when they break, they tend to um, kind of crumble apart a little bit. So they have less um, cohesion with the, or cohesion within themselves. Um, and while I also, while I have this picture up, I just want to um, remind everyone that previous restorations um, beyond uh, identifying what material your ceramic is made out of, um, a, a condition issue to um, kind of be aware of uh, our, our previous restorations, because that can inform how you will care for your object. Um, and then other things like glaze delamination, um, a lot of the things that we looked at um, previously. Um, okay. So let's talk about general care. So this is a nice um, image of a, a nice storage in the Gardner Museum with the ceramics um, easily visible on a, um, in a cabinet on a padded surface. So um, our general care practices are really informed by kind of the um, agents of deterioration that most put ceramics at risk. And these are physical forces and pollutants. Um, and so <clears throat> up here in the Northwest where we have some, and in California, um, we have seismic activity. We might see um, general care in storage look a little bit different. So um, with kind of pads added to prevent um, objects for moving around on the shelf. So those are all kinds of things that we want to take into consideration during um, handling, transport, and display. So here is um, an image of storage at Yale. And so this uh, shows some of those pot rings that I was talking about. Sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> Where you have um, protection against an object um, tipping in case of um, seismic activity. And here they are using compactor storage. And so the pot rings are also, although, you know, most of the compactor storage that I've seen it moves very smoothly um, with very narrow um, bases, you could um, you can add this type of um, padding in order to prevent any tipping. Um, on the left, I just, this isn't necessarily what a uh, display looks like in a historic museum, but um, these flat bottom stoneware pieces are, are you know, very adequately placed on um, a display surface and with flat bottoms. Um, they don't necessarily need anything else. Um, in a display, you might have mounts um, in order to be more presentable. Um, in that kind of environment. Um, but for historic homes and um, historic displays, we obviously have less um, or different kinds of parameters that we're working with. So I'm just gonna show a few more examples of nice um, ways for um, storing ceramic objects. You know, down in the right here, these are jade, um, but 
I, it was just a really nice example of kind of a form um, cavity storage where each object has its own little box. Um, and I wanted to bring this up also because um, these um, methods for creating storage boxes and this one up in the left, this box actually has a little window on the front so you can see the object without taking it out of the box. Um, how do the instructions for creating these different types of storage um, all can be found on this website stash C so I have the um, link down here on the left. And um, so if you actually have a great storage method and want to submit it, you can uh, we can add it to the stash website. Um, there's instructions for submitting um, different <clears throat> uh solutions for storage um but also you know if you are looking for ideas or inspiration or instructions for volunteers um, this is a really great resource another resource is um, choosing the aic wiki so i know this is a really long <laughs> link um, but if you go to conservation-wiki.com um, you can find this resource on choosing materials for storage exhibition and transport and it just provides um, kind of a methodology and a way for making um, decisions about how what kinds of materials you can and should use and how to make those decisions <clears throat> okay so i'm going to transition into cleaning methods and so um Cleaning methods for ceramics really range from stain reduction, removal, um, chelating solutions, uh, detergents, and even steam cleaning occasionally. So um, when deciding which of these methods to use for stain reduction, um, we would, um, I would uh, examine my my ceramic in a really good light to establish if there's any potential problems. Um, remember that it isn't always necessary to remove all dirt or stains. And so determining, you know, what is um, useful for historic um, reference um, before cleaning is really important. So I like to remind people that um, cleaning is one of the things that we do as conservators that is not reversible. And we talk about using reversible materials and, um, but um, cleaning is not a reversible action. We can't put that dirt back. So don't, um, we don't wanna go forward with it until we're sure that it's something that we wanna do. Um, and so dirt or stains may have historic interest or it also may be impossible to remove without causing damage to the piece. And so these are considerations. Um, and so as we move forward with cleaning, we also would want to test a small area um, to make sure that it will work the way that we want it to and won't cause damage um, before we go ahead and clean a whole piece. Um, other potential conditions to look out for before cleaning are firing cracks, that crazing that we that I showed you pictures of, or pitting in the glaze. So pitting in the glaze um, will, sorry, just a second. Um, pitting in the glaze will is an area where you know the glaze, the glassy glaze, um, is not protecting the um, ceramic body. So we'll look for structural damage, um, for example, chips and cracks. Um, and <clears throat> if, you can also sometimes do a little bit of sounding. Um, so tapping very lightly um, can allow you to hear um, a ringing tone for porcelain um, and a dull sound often indicates a structural flaw, like a crack um, can prevent that, um, that oral that sound. Um, we'll also, we would also look for flaking, lifting, um, unstable surfaces. And um, we're doing this because um, uh, the we want to make sure like the glazes are not going to um, be exact or 
the condition issues are not going to be exacerbated during the cleaning process. Um, enamels on a surface or enamel type of glaze can be slightly raised um, and may not have a, um, a good adhesion to the rest of the glaze and so sometimes can flake um, during cleaning if the edges are damaged. Um, and the times when you should really avoid um, water and exposure to water um, is those porous ceramics which can um, damage or stain a, um, a ceramic body or a glaze and actually can drive uh, soils deeper into the, clay, into the clay and make it um, impossible to remove. Um, restorations, previous restorations, as I mentioned, um, are always more sensitive to cleaning than the original ceramic. Um, other low fired glazes, such as luster, are vulnerable to abrasion. Um, and let's see, I think that's it. Oh, and then um, if you have a ceramic with other um, elements that are attached to it, so perhaps there's um, metal leaf or actually like um, some sort of a metal uh, handle or wood handle on a ceramic teapot or something like that, um, those should be treated differently than the ceramic. So um, I am wanted to show you this is a terracotta earthenware um, piece that was from um, a burial. And um, so this can, this, uh, piece has some um, soluble salts on the surface. And I wanted to show you this um, just to give an example of a type of, so you can see what salts on the surface actually look like. Um, they don't always look like this. They're usually white and you can see this is a haze. This piece was, it was possible to actually treat it with a poultice. And so this is before and at, before at the top here and after at the bottom. Um, removal of salts is something that you should only undertake with training. Um, and we're not going to go over that in this um, talk today. Um, okay. Um, steam cleaning is um, another um, method of cleaning that's that. Um, conservators sometimes use. And I am bringing some of these treatment options up, not necessarily so that you will carry them out yourself, but just so that you are aware that these are common practices. So if you work with a conservator and they um, suggest or recommend one of these methods, um, you will know that um, it is uh, not crazy or um, that it is something that is commonly used and, and can be done safely um, with uh, training. And so um, this is a steam cleaning on a, an architectural surface, but that's basically what it looks like. Um, it can be used on porcelain. Um, it's particularly useful for cleaning grime off of um, unglazed porcelain or bisqueware. Um, and in this example at the bottom, you can see that this like really embedded grime in these cracks and the pits in the glaze um, have been cleaned really well, uh, have been cleaned off very well with um, steam cleaning. Okay, so now I'm going to transition back to maintenance care and I can see that I'm running low on time. So I'm going to try and do this um, as quickly as possible but still get you the information. So the primary cleaning methods I would consider for maintenance care are um, dusting, cosmetic sponges, and aqueous cleaning. Um, so to remove dust um, with a brush, you would brush lightly off over the surface um, and into a vacuum. Um, and um, let's see, and um, cosmetic sponges can also be used for dry cleaning to um, remove soiling 
um, gently from the surface, from an intact surface. And then before I do the live demonstration, I just want to um, reiterate that um, water and moisture should not be applied to porous ceramics as it can drive um, soiling into the surface, cause tide lines, and um, active, actually activate soluble salts. Um, so let's see. Here is an example of cleaning with a swab and the type of grime that can come off of the surface. This is a gilded um, porcelain. And then um, I am going to stop sharing and do my live demonstration. So um, for dusting, I would use one of these types of brushes that's like uh, this is a mop style watercolor brush, and this is a um, hake brush, a Japanese brush that has um, a wooden ferrule. Well, I don't know if you would call that a ferrule, but um, it holds the bristles, um, the brushes in place um, just with this wood. So it's nice and soft. And so with this metal ferrule, I actually um, wrap those with blue tape. Um, just like this. So I'm coming just above over onto the brush hairs. Um, so that top edge of the ferrule is covered. Um, and so that creates a little bit of padding um, on the ceramic. So I'm going to show you how to, this one's not very dusty, but I'll show you the dusting method for this. Um, and so not everything will necessarily be this nice open surface. You might have like little interstices to get into. And so having the um, tape on here helps um, prevent knocking the metal into the ceramic. Because as we said, um, physical damage and impact is the, one of the most pro problematic things for ceramics. So um, I'm not going to turn on the vacuum because of the noise, but this is basically my, um, technique for dusting. So holding the vacuum over away from the object and actually just dusting. Oh, here I, you can see better on this edge, um, dusting up into the vacuum. And I might even like hold my brush up in the vacuum head to pull dust off if it's a very thick layer. Um, I might also put this brush head on here. So I'm not going to use this brush against the ceramic, but it will help prevent um, the uh, the vacuum head from hitting against the ceramic, but also like creating suction on the surface. So um, it can sometimes just make it easier. Um, they also make these really nice um, micro vacuum attachments. So I would attach this to the nozzle. And then I have this really small head, which also there's a brush attachment for that as well. Um, sometimes it makes it harder. Sometimes it makes it easier. I usually hold the um, vacuum um, handle. So this part in between my legs to kind of control it and make sure it doesn't move around and hit anything. You could put it in a clamp. Um, and then, so then I can just use this and this can be a little bit easier to manipulate, especially if I have a large thing and lots of little inter, um, areas to get into. Okay, so that is <clears throat> dusting. Uh, These are the um, cosmetic sponges. Most of you have probably seen them. Some of you maybe not. So you can buy them in big bags. Um, they come in different shapes and sizes. This is a nice wedge shape. Um, and so I would use my clean surface and just gently wipe and check. Um, this one's not very dirty. However, I know that um, I dust the fronts because these hang, these are um, just some things from my personal collection. They hang on the wall. So the front gets dusted relatively um, regularly, but the back doesn't. And so I might pick this up. And so this nice little edge kind of gets into that, um, the foot ring here. 
And um, we can see that I've picked up some dirt off of there. So those are a nice option. They can be used on most intact surfaces. Um, then for um, aqueous cleaning, I mean, just using plain water, so not tap water, but um, uh, I would call it like distilled or purified water. A lot of um, drinking water, bottled large jugs of drinking water you can get are either from the grocery store or distilled or actually um, purified by reverse osmosis. Um, you don't want to use something that has a something that has minerals in it. Um, so a lot of like natural spring waters, like Poland spring, um, it actually, they are trying to keep the minerals in it for the flavor, but you wanna look for something that is um, demineralized. So um, here I have my jar of cotton wool. And so I'll make, um, make a little swab like this, put it into the water. Um, I often have like another paper towel to remove any, make sure that it's not dripping wet. You just want it to be moistened. <clears throat> and I wouldn't normally hold it up in the air. Um, I'd be working on the surface, you know, with the um, object down on the table, but this is just for demonstration. And then you want to roll the swab away. And then you can see there's a little bit of um, gray soiling. So soiling is gray. Um, if you see any color besides gray, then stop immediately because you're removing something else that's not um, dust and grime. Um, here you can see this one. You can see a little bit of gray on here. Um, and so, um, the feet, the, this foot ring, um, is typically not glazed. And so it is less protected from water. So you don't want to rub your, um, wet cleaning method, um, all over the foot, um, but just on the glazed glassy surfaces. So this is what dirt should look like. Oh, I don't know if it's in focus, but. Um, that's the color is the most important thing. So um, sometimes soiling um, and dust has accumulated over time and um, it's not going to come off just with plain water. You need um, something with a little bit more cutting power. Um, I have seen that um, uh, detergents are, are sometimes suggested for cleaning. Um, if I generally don't use um, any um, soaps or detergents because that's something that really needs to be cleaned off or rinsed off. And so what I like to use is um, what I often use is like um, my own glass cleaner, which is a mixture of um, water, ethanol or, or um, alcohol, not rubbing alcohol, but um, drinking alcohol um, in a high percentage, not um, de so denatured alcohol. Um, or And then um, I raise the pH with ammonium hydroxide. And so that those all of those things will evaporate off the surface. They won't stay on the surface, which is the problem with detergents. So again, I might make my little swab um, wipe it over the surface. Um, and you can see um, how much more grime I'm getting off and this clean area. I had used just the water there before, um, but it wasn't sufficient. Um, and this works much more effectively. <clears throat> So that might be my test if I'm working on a large group of ceramics that need to be cleaned. Um, I might use these um, cotton pads. So they're um, Webroll um, pads and they are 
look like this. Blah. Sorry, they like they're like this. Um, they Weberl also makes these um, cotton. I don't know. They're not called pads, but if they're in a roll, and so you can just you know, I'm not going to do this right now, but um, take the lid off, get the whole thing kind of dampened, and then wipe larger areas and clean it off um, more efficiently. So. I do want to be in control of everything, but I don't want to do everything with a swab because I'm trying to work as efficiently um, as possible. So once I have ascertained that my cleaning method is safe, then um, I will move on that way. Okay, so I think um, I'm going to just go back to this for a second and then um, so <laughs> now it's time for questions and um, I am, I can share these resources with you too that I have. Um, there's a couple of nice online resources um, that have some of this information there as well. So Beth, um, that's my presentation part. Well, thank you so much, Samantha. We do have a number of questions that have come in. Uh, Catherine has asked, is it okay to handle ceramics with bare hands in a museum environment? Um, it depends. <laughs> um, uh, so some people feel more comfortable with that. I would say, you know, if you want, need, want to use bare hands, then you should, they should be freshly cleaned and fully dried. Um, so I know there's like a big debate whether you should use gloves or not because you know they might slip um i never use cotton gloves which is where i think there's the biggest potential for um you know not having a good grip on your ceramics the nitrile gloves um actually give you more grip i usually use gloves no matter what because my hands get dried out from overwashing and then i end up putting cream on and then so i don't want to transfer that onto the ceramics um i would um recommend so as i said like earthen wares and those low fire ceramics or unglazed things pick up grime much more easily and so um, if you feel really strongly about this, I would at least wear gloves for that and then use your clean hands for the other glazed things. Do you use a HEPA vacuum? Yes, um, yes, I do use a HEPA vacuum. I have a Mila, um, but um, yeah. Like I would highly recommend a HEPA if you're using it in any um, store, like anywhere around artwork. And particularly a lot of them have a way of mitigating, because you don't want to spread the dirt back around, but um, mitigating it, the exhaust. So then you also don't have like a strong air stream going back out into your collections area. Cindy is wondering if the difference between earthenware and stoneware is only in the firing temperature or do they contain any different base materials as well? Uh, that's a great question. So um, yeah, stoneware typically has other like um, quartz and feldspar and other minerals in it that actually give it more, give it more structure is not quite the right way of saying it, but it gives it more strength and um, um, it's less prone to, it helps the clay hold up while it's being fired at that higher temperature. For crockware, like the flat bottom ones that you had uh, a photograph of, is it safe to store and or display their lids in a in place, aka with the lid covering the opening and resting on the crock's lip? Um, yeah, I I for the most part it should be safe. Um, I, um, I mean, I've, again, this kind of depends on the, um, condition of the lip and that kind of thing. Um, you, I think, you know, keeping things together, objects together with their lids, um, is an important, losing information is also, um, a 
potential condition problem. So um, if so, um, you can safely store them together as long as everything is in good condition. You can also put like an interleaving of tissue paper if you're afraid of abrasion. Um, but then on the other side, if you're in a seismic zone, um, you may want to keep them separately or um, have some sort of a storage container that prevents the lid from potentially bouncing off of the jumping off of the object. One of those, it depends. Yes, my favorite answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have a question from Angelica uh, asking if later on we could talk a little bit more about how you manage those amazingly smooth infills and how to prevent pl the plaster from going into the pores of earthenwares during infilling procedures. Um, so I um, generally I like um, would put a barrier layer of the adhesive that I'm using on the break edges. And so um, Usually it's on there when you're putting things together. And actually I have, this is the ceramic that I had that was on the wall and it fell off and broke. So I'm in the process of repairing it um, also for my own collection. So, um, and yeah, the, these are, um, yeah. So there's like that uh, adhesive barrier layer on the break edges so that um, if I need to take this out, um, I can clean out all of the um, all of that fill material because they don't look that small, but um, or they don't the fills don't look that big, um, but they do actually some of them like are small on the top and then kind of grow <laughs> towards the center of the ceramic. Do you have any advice following up on that for cleaning porcelain cracks, such as where bonded piece, pieces have pieces have been bonded and the crack is still visible afterwards? And would you retouch the crack to not be visible? Um, I, I think I missed the beginning of the question. All right. Do you have advice for cleaning porcelain cracks? For example, when bonding pieces together, the oh. crack is still visible afterwards. Yeah, I mean, that um, is usually with, um, so you can use chelating solutions and poultices. Um, I, like these are not things that I would recommend um, without um, uh, training. Um, and also steam cleaning can sometimes be used for that. Um, but again, Again, like the steam produces a lot of power. And so it should only be used um, where the break edges are very, are actually very stable and structurally sound. But the, it is possible to clean them out to an extent to reduce the visibility um, of those breaks. And, and sometimes you can have stains um, and be able to get some of that grime out, or sorry, you can have stains in kind of blind cracks, so cracks, but they haven't fully opened up. You get some staining in there, and those can also sometimes be cleaned out. <clears throat> Is it safe to use smaller brushes? And um, this uh, person asked that she finds that some of the brushes with the wooden handles tend to shed. Is that something to be cautious of? Um, no, if if it's shedding, um, you know, that that's not really an issue. If you like um, to have control with a smaller brush, I mean, I this one's, um, I think, one and a half inches. I think they make them even smaller. Um, if it's, uh, I think um, what you really want is to have something with soft and kind of movable, easily movable or brushes, or what am I trying to say, hairs. Um, so if you have something that's a lot stiffer or smaller, um, you may tend to, the idea is to like move loose dust off. If you have to work much more than what you can get off with this, then you shouldn't be dusting with the brush. You should move to some other cleaning method. 
we have a question about uh, when you were saying that the dust, if it's coming off dust is gray. Um, doesn't the color of the dust vary by region according to the color of the local rocks and sand? <clears throat> okay, yes. Yeah, so I guess where um, what I'm when we're talking about that, so yes, if you have like an archaeological object and it came out of the dirt, there that's like a different cleaning method altogether. We're just talking about kind of general care in terms of like you have it already in your collection, it's collected dust, and we need to get it off. Or maybe you have something that came in from someone else, you know, someone else collected them and is donating them to your organization. Um, so if you have Yes, those in those particular cases, you might have um, red dish dirt dust, but generally, like when you're getting it off, most most dust that we want to remove is, um, you know, human skin and fibrous material from clothing, and so that is the type of thing we're trying to remove. Um, it becomes sticky over time because mites eat the dust, <laughs> eat the human skin, and their excrement. Uh, allows it to um, cling or become sticky. And so that's when, you know, just dusting with a brush is insufficient. And so you need to use something that's a little bit um, can cut into that. Um, so that is generally what I'm talking about in terms of general care. We have a few questions with regard to your uh, glass cleaner. Is there somewhere that one could buy a ceramic safe glass cleaner like you spoke of, or should it always be handmade? And if so, could you share again your recipe for the handmade cleaner? Um, so uh, I don't know of anywhere that you can buy it, um, but it all of those three materials are generally easy to come by. So um, you can um, mix them up yourself. Um, I would say, you know, ethanol you want to be able to use and ammonium hydroxide um, can come in quite a strong um, concentration which and they need to be mixed up in a place where there's a lot of ventilation so that you because they can be harmful to you. We have a question about saliva and uh, Molly has been told that saliva can be an effective cleaning method. Would you recommend that? Um, yeah, I mean, I was taught um, that to use saliva. However, in this case, um, I were more um, more recently. I think um, people have really moved away from using saliva in terms of like the DNA and all of that kind of stuff that you are then potentially impacting putting onto the object um, and something that then doesn't get cleaned off. So um, uh, yeah, I, I think um, obviously it dissolves a lot of stuff and so it can be used, but I would generally <laughs> um, stay away from um, using saliva. Just brings me back to my archeology span days and testing all the soil types. Yeah. There must be a better way. Um, ceramics that were glued to another surface with an acetone soluble glue. For those, is it safe to use a large amount of acetone to completely remove the glue? Um, I mean, that really depends. I mean, what I, th I that doesn't really fall under general care for me. So <laughs> um, I, there's a lot um, to that question that like we, I can't really get into at this right, um, right now, <laughs> that would be a whole other um, talk. And perhaps a good one to email a conservator about. We'll put Samantha's yeah. email address <laughs> back up on the screen at the end here. And so that would be one uh, to, to reach out on the specific case. I forgot to mention that there was follow-up that it was an earthenware piece, but Okay. Email, email a conservator. Um, for your repair, what is the filling made of and how is the filling reversible? Um, so the fill material that I used here, it's called 
it's Fluger. It's a commercial um, uh, spackle. It's acrylic modified. So it has an acrylic um, component. So as opposed to, pla so it is readily soluble in acetone and water. So I can remove it with those. It's also relatively soft. So I can kind of poke at it with um, a tool in order to break it up. But it also, um, as what the question that came up before, you know, it's also reversible because I've put a barrier layer on the, cer on the ceramic body. So the fill material has not like gone into the pores of the object. So I can um, get it off in that way. It's so convenient that you broke that dish and had to have it on. I know, right? <laughs> I'll have to have some teaching materials around. <laughs> can you expand on the concept of how high-fired ceramics can spring when broken and how that affects a reassembly treatment? Yeah, so, um, okay. So this has to do with the, the clay um, particles, which are like platelets. So, um, uh, okay, so going back to like prepping your clay, you usually like knead it in order to get all the platelets to align um, and then, and to remove air bubbles um, because that can cause things to burst in the kiln. Um, so the platelets will be in alignment and kind of flat on, flattish on each other. Um, so then um, as you're working it, if you like, uh, um, if you, if you manipulate it, the, um, the platelets may move and you can push it back, but they'll have a memory. And so um, when the object is fired, it will have that memory and tension underneath in it. So once it breaks, you'll have um, some spring. Um, so it will open up and then you can't push those um, pieces back together, they'll always be slightly out of alignment. So um, that can also happen with the um, glaze, with the glazes when they have, or with the glaze and the clays, clay body, if they are um, slightly incompatible in terms of their firing temperatures and cooling temperatures, um, you can get this tension in there. So then when it breaks, it, um, it actually shifts out of alignment. So you can't force them back together to like have all of those breaks um, match up. I hope that answers that. A little bit of physics too. Yes. Um, we'll just do one last question following up on our previous question about your glass cleaner. Would you be willing to share the ratios that you recommend for the water ethanol and ammonium hydroxide? Um, so it's just a one-to-one -one mixture of water and um, ethanol. And then you have to add the ammonium hydroxide to get to a pH, a, a, I use pH nine. Um, so you also need a pH meter. There's no, it depends on how much you're mixing up. There's no like set amount of the ammonium hydroxide. Well, thank you, Samantha. I'm going to quickly put my screen back up here. Uh, and right now I'm dropping into the chat links to both our YouTube page, as I mentioned, and our website workshops page. So you can find the videos of all of our previous webinars um, and a link on the top of that page, the webinar, the workshops page to register for our next webinar, which will be Thursday, December 16th at 10 a.m. We'll have Ozge again, Chai Ustin, talking about handling safely handling hazardous materials in our collection. So sp specifically those previously treated with pesticide items uh, that we, we all have a lot of examples of. So don't forget to go ahead, subscribe to our YouTube page. We'll have this video posted in a few days and then register for the next one so that you will be all set to go. Before we lose you all, I'm going to quickly put mine and Samantha's contact information back up here on the screen. Uh, if you have any ideas about other topics that we haven't addressed yet that you'd love to see covered, please don't hesitate to reach out to me, rcwrvicechair at gmail.com. Uh, but if you have questions about the specific content we've been talking about in today's uh, webinar, for those 
best to talk to the expert. And so Samantha's contact information is right there as well. If you had a question that we weren't able to get to today, that would be another great reason to maybe reach out to Samantha. Uh, we did our best to get through to all of them, but I hope that you have all enjoyed this webinar. Thank you so much, Samantha, for now presenting twice with us in this series. And we hope that all of you will be able to join us again for our next webinar in December.